my name is Gaurav Behel, and uh, I'm in the Mechanical Science and Engineering Department. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, what we call Brillouin Optomechanics, or Photonic MEMS. Uh, so the group is made up of uh, currently just a few grad students, so we've got, uh, the group is going to get larger pretty soon, and uh, we have a few undergrads as well. And we're developing a variety of expertise, uh, but to start the talk itself, um, the premise is that when we have uh, an energy source and a microscale object and we want to make the microscale object move, we typically need a variety of forces and that's what MEMS has done. We've exploited a, a, a wide variety of forces for actuation in the past. And indeed, um, since we're all, well many of us are electrical engineers over here, we probably know about surface wave acoustic, surface acoustic wave devices, which we have hundreds of in this room right now. Um, they're in our cell phones. So uh, this is the basic idea that you know surface acoustic wave devices are essentially sound devices, sound control devices. So we'll get back to that. Um, but uh, to continue on the idea of what kind of forces can be exploited for making uh, microsystems move around, uh, one of the forces that has recently uh, started to be explored is uh, photonics, right? basically optical forces. For example, radiation pressure. And you can think of radiation pressure in a simple wave phenomena picture, but you can even think of it as a particle phenomenon, where you have a photon which carries some linear momentum, and it comes in from the left, this green photon here, it bounces off the mirror, right? And because the linear momentum of the photon is now reversed, there, well, we have to conserve momentum. We know that is a fundamental property of this universe. So where does that momentum go? Well, the mirror gains momentum, essentially. So the vector nature of momentum must be conserved. Uh, and actually, based on that concept, Japan actually launched a solar sail-based uh, space probe a few years ago, and it's a successful concept. So you know, it's a well-established idea that radiation pressure exists. Um, there are other optical forces as well. Uh, gradient force, which we use in optical tweezers very frequently. Uh, and then there's the electrostrictive force, which is slightly less known, but you may be familiar with the idea that if you submerge a capacitor uh, in water, uh, or if you have a dielectric adjacent to a capacitor, when you apply a voltage across it, the dielectric rushes in. And essentially, there's a pressure increase within the, uh, the capacitor plates. And that's electrostriction. Uh, ultimately, they're all based on the gradient of energy argument. right? That's all these optical forces. That's how they work. So today, I won't dwell on this slide too long. Uh, we're going to talk about how sound can be controlled with light. And it's going to be kind of a three-part talk. And if we have, if you're short on time, you can let me know, and I can skip uh, things. It's not a very long talk either way. All right. So uh, the experimental devices that my group works with are um, ultra-high Q optomechanical resonators. Right. These are basically. Uh, so far, we've been working in fused silica, but a lot of people also work in silicon nitride as well. And they are released optical resonators, so they are free to vibrate mechanically as well. They come in a variety of shapes. Right? The, the overarching theme, if you'll notice, that all of them are somewhat circular devices, uh, and they are all basically whispering gallery microresonators. And what a whispering gallery microresonator is, is a borrowed concept from acoustics, uh, which was initially described by Rayleigh in these uh, old European cathedrals, where if you have a, a source, you're all out of juice on this laser point. So if you're, uh, oh, we don't have any laser pointer now. Oh well, it's not a problem. So uh, yeah, so the whispering gallery resonator is essentially a resonant chamber where um, any signal, any wave signal, like sound or light, can resonate, right? So you can think of the resonance condition as a constructive interference condition. Thank you very much. All right. So it's a constructive interference condition where the total path length of the resonator must be an integer multiple of the wavelengths, right? And that's how uh, these resonances occur. Um, and in particular, uh, the phenomenon that we are interested in, as I said, was radiation pressure. Right? So uh, if we have a whispering gallery resonator and we somehow couple light into it, right? so the, the resonator itself has a resonance that is described by some kind of a Lorentzian function. And when you put a laser on it, we couple some light into it. Uh, and now let's say we have the light circulating around this device. If you track the motion of an individual photon, right, an individual photon carries linear momentum, and the linear momentum is changing as it goes around the device. So, well, what could possibly do that? It has to be a force, 
Right? There's, there's something, momentum is not being conserved. So force is making the photon uh, change its momentum vector. And that basically leads to centrifugal radiation pressure. And the cavity feels an outward force on its walls. There's a very slight deformation of the cavity, which causes the optical mode to shift, and which then means that not enough light is coupling in, for instance, uh, which would cause the cavity to collapse back. And so now you can see how there's a perpetual oscillation where the cavity expands. It breathes in and then breathes out, and it just expands and contracts at an eigenmechanical frequency. So that's, uh, that's a case where the mechanical frequency is defined by both geometry and materials, right? It's a mechanical eigenmode of the structure. Um, this work was actually initiated at Caltech, actually. Uh, Michael Rukus' uh, colleagues, um, uh, Kerry Vahala and, and his team. Uh, more recently, what we've been doing is looking at stimulated Brillouin scattering, which is dependent on the electrostrictive force. So you have two optical waves now, instead of just one. And uh, you can imagine some kind of a, a spatiotemporal interference pattern that is generated because of the interference of these two co-traveling, co co-propagating waves. Uh, they don't have to travel in opposite directions as I've drawn here. They can be traveling in the same direction. But what you end up getting is an overlap pattern that has a low frequency component that can be an acoustic wavelength in size and can also be traveling at the speed of sound if things are just phase matched correctly. Uh, the second phenomenon that we need is the Brillouin scattering of light from sound. So when light enters a material where there's some fluctuation in the material property, for example an acoustic wave perturbing the refractive index of the material, you will experience scattering. And because light generates sound, and sound basically scatters light, you can imagine a light-sound feedback loop, which was initially proposed by none other than Charles Towns, our famed inventor of the laser, back in 1964. Uh, this is SBS, and it's a well-known phenomenon. It occurs in pretty much every dielectric. Um, as I said, the, there's a phase matching condition, but let's not worry about that too much. But uh, the takeaway here is that the mechanical frequency is defined by the host material and the wavelength of light used. Right? So it's less dependent on geometry. Uh, in microresonators, because the quality factors are so high, uh, you don't need very high power to make SPS appear. And with just a few microwatts of input power, you can get these 11 gigahertz surface acoustic waves that are basically half, uh, half micron wavelength surface acoustic waves traveling on these 100 micron spheres. Um, very high frequency oscillators built in a matter of minutes um, and very easy to do. Um, so yeah, in this case, as I said, the frequency was not as much defined by the geometry. But recently we further explored, and we published this in Nature Communications in 2011, uh, a mechanism by which uh, if you couple light into one of these whispering gallery resonators, and there are some phonons populating a low frequency acoustic wave mode, right? So it's a whispering gallery acoustic mode, not just a whispering gallery optical mode. Uh, once phonons uh, are present there, they can scatter some light, and you get forward stimulated Brillouin scattering, resulting in the actuation of lower frequency acoustic waves. And you can see that both in the optical spectra and in the mechanical spectra. And this is basically a Brillouin lasing process. So this is a mechanical kind of laser. Right? So phonons are lasing in this device. Um, right. So not only can we uh, actually generate one frequency at a time with this, uh, with this technology, but we can actually generate a variety of frequencies. And what you see <laughs> at the bottom here is a peak hold spectrum where x-axis is frequency, vertical axis is power, and logarithmic arbitrary units. Um, and what you find is that you can capture a variety of these frequencies just by tuning your laser. And so by selecting a specific laser wavelength, you can tune this oscillator over a huge, over a huge uh, variety of frequencies. And not only can you do this, but on the same device, you can also do the 11 gigahertz version, so the microwave frequency oscillator. And you can do this simultaneously. And at the very end, I have a little picture of a simultaneous, simultaneous actuation of these modes. So ultimately, you know, the dream technology here is you select your wavelength, and you get an oscillation out, an oscillation frequency out over four orders of magnitude of frequency. Uh, and, and I don't think any other oscillator technology can do this. Uh, please do inform me if that claim is incorrect. Uh, so no other single device oscillator can do this. Right. Um, so on to some more uh, recent things that we've been working on. 
I uh, showed the uh, electron microscope image of this microfluidic optomechanical device, which is about 100 microns in diameter. It's variable. We can select what diameter we need. And as you can see, there's a little central bulge right there. And that is where we, simul where we simultaneously confine optical modes and mechanical modes. And so using our uh, uh, radiation pressure optomechanics technology, we can do breathing modes where the entire capillary expands and contracts. Right? And those are lower frequency. And we can do very high frequency acoustic whispering gallery modes. And I will show some examples of this on the next slide. Um, and these are actuated by Brillouin scattering. So that's Brillouin optomechanics, and this is radiation pressure optomechanics. Um, you know, so because it's a microfluidic device, we can start pumping fluids through it and try to do all sorts of exciting experiments now involving biology. Um, and as I promised, uh, I wanted to show you some examples of uh, experiments performed within this device. Uh, we, well, we definitely can actuate wine glass mechanical modes, which are you know wine glass style modes that are four nodes. Uh, then we can also go an order of magnitude higher in frequency, closer to 100 megahertz, and uh, we can go another order of magnitude higher, uh, uh, closer to a gigahertz, and then we can finally go another order of magnitude higher, around 10 gigahertz. So this is basically that promise of an ultra-tunable oscillator, except in this case all these experiments were performed with water inside the device. And what is exciting about the first two modes shown here, they have deformation on the inside, which means they are sensitive, uh, they will be sensitive to the liquid present in there. And so in our preliminary experiments we have actually observed tuning of the acoustical mode frequency as a function of the density and viscosity of the liquid on the inside. So this is uh, uh, in the beginning phases of the makings of an optomechanical biosensor. Um, so it's kind of nice to know that just two days ago we got accepted to Nature Communications for this paper. Um, and ultimately, this is, the, this is one of the last elements that I had during my postdoctoral work, which uh, has a potential for improving uh, optic, uh, well, optical and MEMS-based uh, sensor technology. And the idea is uh, optomechanical cooling. And this is a concept that has existed for a while, but this is the first uh, experiment that we have performed on actually cooling sound using light. You know, previously people have worked on standing wave eigenmechanical modes. In this case, we're actually working, we're actually cooling a traveling mode, so we're cooling phonons that are occupied a traveling acoustic mode. Uh, the concept is simple. Once you have these two optical modes that we're using in the previous experiment where we're actuating, uh, where we're actuating surface acoustic waves, uh, in other words, we put a photon in, it scatters to a lower energy, and in the process, a phonon is created. But you can simply imagine that the process could be reversed if you pump the lower energy mode, it'll scatter to the higher energy mode, um, and in turn, annihilating phonons. And this process does occur. We verified this experimentally for the first time in 2012. Uh, and what we showed was that the Brownian mechanical vibration at 300 Kelvin gets cooled down to an equivalent temperature of about 19 Kelvin. So not only do you see a reduction in the total amount of scattering as you increase optical power, which is very unusual for a nonlinear process. Nonlinear processes really get worse when you put in more power. Uh, so over here, the nonlinearity actually diminishes, and the line width also broadens, which is indication of this cooling. And note that the Brownian motion actually over here, which is for an acoustic mode that looks like that, um, is about 10 femtometers in amplitude. So we go way below that in amplitude. Um, so ultimately, we have a, a broad vision for a research group, which involves both you know, very fundamental type research, uh, going all the way towards more and more and more applied research where we're talking about uh, surface acoustic wave sensors and devices and adaptive cognitive oscillators. Um, so this is overall the, uh, the broad scheme of things, how we're going to proceed from this point on. Uh, and actually, this is a list of our key publications. And uh, uh, just a few days ago, we, uh, we submitted this to a conference, which is a radiation pressure uh, and SBS-driven simultaneously optomechanical pressure sensor, the first of its kind. Uh, it's the first multi-mode uh, optomechanical system. Um, and what we show is that these 11 gigahertz modes and the 16 megahertz modes simultaneously get tuned, and they have different pressure coefficients, so you can self-reference this device. So we're looking forward to some exciting work here as well. Um, that, thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Time for question.
Yeah, Deepa. What is the detection limit for the sensor? Uh, sensitivity? Well, uh, we've done some preliminary calculations with the device that we have right now. Um, and for a simple four micron particle, let's say, of silica, we should be able to detect a 10 part per million frequency <laughs> shift, which is pretty detectable. Uh, but ultimately, the, the ultimate limits is something that we don't yet have an answer for. So we'll be working on that very soon. And second question is, uh, basically, <coughs> you use the frequency to isolate the optical modes and acoustic modes, right? The frequency is what separate both. I'm not sure I quite understand. Or the optical modes and acoustic modes? We don't have to filter the optical modes and the acoustic modes because you pump the optical mode and you get a vibration signal out, which is a modulation of the optical signal. So you don't actually have to do any filtering, really. It's different domain signals. One is electrical domain, one is optical domain. So my question is, during conversion, during conversion if there's a light going in counterclockwise or clockwise direction, it can come and interfere with the acoustic Oh, it certainly could, but the phase matching requirements for this process, phase matching means energy conservation and momentum conservation simultaneously. Those requirements are very stringent, and you can't always satisfy them. So even if there are other signals, other interfering signals present, you won't get the phenomenon from them. You will only get one instance at a time. Does that answer? We thank our speaker again. Okay.